My name is David, and this is The Big Shut-In. It is Tuesday, September 8th, day 178 by my reckoning since all of the madness began. And today I spoke to Catherine Christopher, Professor Catherine Christopher, Cassie to her friends, who teaches law in the graduate school at Texas Tech in Lubbock, Texas. That's Texas Tech, as you'll hear later. And Cassie is one of my wife's oldest friends. They've known each other for, for many years, and she is a truly wonderful person, brilliant and funny, and I enjoyed talking to her for that reason, that she's a very pleasant person to speak to. Also because it was an opportunity to hear from a part of the country that I don't often hear from. And we got into some really interesting stuff, I think, both about parenting and what's going on with the reopening of schools, which is on everyone's mind right now, even people without children, and also some interesting perspectives on what it's like to live in a relatively small city in a relatively rural part of the country, and what that does for your perspective, how it's different from perhaps my perspective here in great big and admittedly self-important New York City. I think you'll enjoy spending a little time with us and with this conversation. And so I'll start without further ado. Here's Cassie. So how how are you? How are you doing? I'm okay. <laughs> every, every hour is pretty good, but there are a lot of hours. Uh, it's There's something going all the time, and that is exhausting. But every hour in and of itself is, is pretty good. Every everyone? Um most, <laughs> most of them, yeah. Um I mean I'm not gonna say every every minute of every hour is good, but Oh right. But the average, like if you were average all yeah. sixty of those minutes. <laughs> yes, no, is it's definitely positive. That's well that's that's great. Um everybody's I mean, are you guys um I mean so for people who don't know you you've do three kids. Uh, which is a lot of kids, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, at least one too many. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, oh, God. Did your husband put the kibosh he, on that? He did, yeah. He did. <laughs> I, I can't say I, I blame him, honestly. Um, but what, uh, I mean, we have two and they're everywhere. There's like, there's no, there's nothing but kids. It's like, there's one, everywhere I look, there's a kid. Uh, I, I get that, but my, my older two are significantly older than the younger one. So I have a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old, and then there's the 3-year-old. And man, 12 and 9 is a different, it's a different kind of parenting. It's more mental than physical. You know, they don't need manhandling anymore. They can use the bathroom by themselves. They can they can cook whole meals, each of them, which is amazing. Wow. Um, it's, it's the 3-year-old that's still that very, like physical manual parenting <laughs> Hands. Still, yeah like she still needs to be hoisted in and out of the bathtub and <laughs> or, i like the, the division of the, the idea of the division of manual and automatic parenting. <laughs> well, like what I kind of transmission is, does this child yeah i think it is being physical and mental parenting you know the three-year-old is pretty easy to outwit but the the nine-year-old <laughs> that's harder <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, but how? What's what's up with you guys with school? Has has it started? Is what are you doing? Yeah, school starts here pretty early, actually. So we are now actually the kids are in week four of their public school program. Um, they they have been at it for a while now. So our our school district has offered face to face instruction for anyone who wants it, or virtual instruction for anyone who elects that. So it would be full time either way. I really wish we could do like two days at school and three days at home, but that's not an option we're given. So my big kids are the ones who are in school, obviously, and they're both doing virtual school. So we've turned what used to be the playroom into the classroom and they sit there with their little Chromebooks all day doing their schoolwork, which is which is partially synchronous and partially asynchronous and, and depends on the age group. 
so yeah, and then the three-year-old is home too. We we had the option to send her to a, a little nursery school, but didn't feel very comfortable doing that. And then my partner and I are both college professors, and we are also teaching from home. So there is a lot of Wi-Fi going on in our house right now. <laughs> a lot of a lot of screens. You know, it's funny. I, I so I talk to a lot of parents, obviously here, mm -hmm. and everyone is kind of looking at the plans for the fall, which are just starting here. My, um, right. my son just started and he's he's early for New York. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at these blended learning mm -hmm. programs and just about, I think I, I could go, with, go ahead and say every parent I've talked to about it has looked at that and said, what the hell is this supposed to be? Mm -hmm. You're the first parent I've ever talked to who said, I wish I would love to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because those of us who have that as an option are mostly saying, what what is this supposed to solve? They're st right. still being exposed. Right. I still can't go to work. What <laughs> What's the goal here? So what what is attractive about that to you? I'm very um, curious to hear. Yeah. So so we've we've obviously we've been wrestling with a lot of this all all the time, <laughs> you know, for months now. And I think you know my primary goal is my kids' physical safety. My secondary goal is their emotional well-being. And then like a distant third is their actual education. But the thing is, my kids are lonely. They're lonely. It's it's just the five of us here at home and they miss their friends. And I, I don't know if you knew this about us, but we live physically across the street from the elementary school. The view from our front porch is of the cafeteria windows. And so, uh, every every weekday we watch 400 friends like go like skipping into school with their backpacks on and then come out again afterwards and we are sitting here in this house just watching them <laughs> so we're lonely and we're, we're trying to arrange for outdoor play dates with another friend that we know is doing virtual school and therefore is hopefully not as germy or or whatever but you know it's it's just not the same and i know it's not the same at school either Kids are all wearing masks and they're trying to social distance and whatnot. But I don't know. It's the loneliness that that we're sad about. Sure. Well, I and I'm I'm surprised. You know, I have a view of online learning and and all of these things in a place where everyone is. I mean, I shouldn't say everyone, but the vast majority of people are opting for, you know, to stay home mm -hmm. because we all live through. April here <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> when yeah. there were just a lot of dead bodies and people yeah. were scared of that, you know, it sounds like a significant percentage of the kids who go to that school are opting to go in person. Yeah. I mean, I don't have the statistics or anything, but, but I think it's probably on the order of like two thirds of them are going in person five days a week. And it's like a third or so that are trying virtual. Although, I mean, virtual is not working terribly well for everybody either. We've sort of made it work for our family, but it's been an evolution even just over the last three and a half weeks. But I know three families just here in my neighborhood who started virtual and have pulled the plug and are just straight up homeschooling their kids. Well, if, if two thirds of the kids are there in person, I can't imagine that the virtual program is getting as much attention. Well, to, uh, actually, so for the elementary school level anyway, the the teachers who are doing the virtual education are just virtual teachers. So, right. you okay. know, my fourth grader has a teacher who has an office at the school across the street, actually, but she is just teaching this online fourth grade classroom all day. So it's not like like that teacher's attention is divided. But here's here's the major problem with online learning. Kids can't type. Ah. <laughs> and... And if you can't type, it's awfully challenging. You know, I mean, I've heard these stories about like the teacher being like, okay, everyone open a new tab. And I'll and, like 40 kids go, what? <laughs> what does that mean? And so, but like I said, like my, their education is the least of my worries. So we, we just like, we just adjusted our expectations. Like week one, we were going to figure out the technology. And then week two, we were going to have a schedule. <laughs> and then week three, maybe we'd learn something. <laughs> That's sort of where we are. Where you live mm -hmm. in Lubbock, Texas, mm -hmm. it's like you might as well tell me you live in the middle of the Sahara Desert mm -hmm. or in like from my viewpoint of like places in the world. It seems yeah. tremendously remote and exotic to me. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> What is the energy there like around 
now. I mean, are people, you know, we, we get reports of t- Texas and mm-hmm. rural America that people are just kind of thumbing their noses at, at safety guidelines and, you know, and I mean, is that what you're seeing there? What's it like on the ground where you are? I live in the one neighborhood that if you look at the New York Times map of, of how counties vote, like I'm the one blue dot in this like sea of red. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of people here, I mean, most everybody here is trying to do the right thing. There are some, you know, jerks who are thumbing their noses. I don't know any jerks who are thumbing their noses. Everybody I know is trying to do the right thing. And we're all trying to start to figure out what that is in a part of the country where we have more space. And I incidentally have a lot of thoughts now on the New Yorkers' perspective of the rest of the country, but that's probably a different conversation. But I mean, we're all trying to figure out, you know, when we go to the playground, do we need to wear masks? And does it depend on how crowded it is? And like, everyone wants to do the right thing. And we're, we're, my friends and I are all excruciatingly polite with each other. You know, I, I've been over at a friend's house in the backyard with kids there. And one of the kids used to use the bathroom. And so like, we ask first, like, is it okay if we go inside to use your bathroom and can we put on our masks before we go? And like, I absolutely insist that we wear our masks in your house. And yeah, everyone's trying to do the right thing, but we don't have any social norms for how we behave in, in this particular world. You know, what, what are the social norms about mask wearing and can you still bump elbows with people? I mean, nobody's hugging anymore, but no. yeah, so it's weird. I- it is. I mean, we so we had new neighbors move in next door to us who have children that are about the same ages as our two children, a little bit younger, both of them, but you know, in the in the ballpark. And we have these little tiny backyards that are right. So if somebody they're in their backyard and we're in our backyard, they're we're hanging out together. I mean, they're and normally, they, you know, they they want to play together, and I'd be like, great, yeah, go play with the neighbors. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And now it's this whole dance of what do what is okay right do we even and we ended up that they're playing together with their masks on in the backyard Mm -hmm. which is great but it's it's just a funny thing that as you said about social norms like all of this stuff that like my whole sense of what is right and wrong and good and bad and how people are supposed to interact none of it applies anymore i don't know what to do right yeah trying to figure out how to be polite and engage with people and not sound judgmental or at the same time, not sound like a crazy person who is taking things way too seriously. I mean, so, I mean, do, do you feel when you say that, you know, two thirds maybe of the school is making the choice that being there is okay. Do you feel judged or is there an energy of conflict between parents making different choices? Do you think? Um, Not that I've experienced. Everyone's been very kind and understanding. I mean, we're in a situation now where all of the options are bad. Sending your kid to Ah. school is a bad option. Keeping your kid at home is a bad option. Homeschooling is a bad option. They're all bad choices. And I think we're all trying to be forgiving of one another. Like, hey, you've made a bad choice, but so did I. It's just a different bad choice. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, right. I think I think that the, the only difference is between considerate bad choices and inconsiderate bad choices. <laughs> right, right. Like, are you being kind in your poor decision making or something? Yes, and and I think everyone is. I think that folks who are sending their kids back to school are doing it because they've got to go to work. And and my partner and I are fortunate enough that we both work from home, and our schedules are flexible enough that we can make this happen. But a lot of families can't, and they need the childcare. God, remember childcare, David. <laughs> I, vaguely. I mean, <laughs> we've been trying to f- arrange some, but it's, I mean, just because we have to, but it's a very challenging. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing, I mean, the whole, yeah. And, and, and the fact that I was thinking about this the other day, you know, there, there's memes going around about like teachers, you know, it's, we're, we're not babysitters. That's not our mm-hmm. job. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, it kind of is though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 the, the the primary you know in a, in an economy where everybody has to work the the primary the secondary function of public education is education and the primary function is childcare it just is i mean yeah i i've been thinking a lot lately about um how 
you know, it, it takes a village to raise a child and we don't have a village anymore. You're no. everyone, everyone's in their own homes and that's it. The village has evaporated. So what's, what's it like at your university right now? What's going on? How's online professing? Yeah, it's, it's not great at the moment. Um, so I teach at the law school, which is a very small and insular part of the larger university. The law school has maybe 500 students and maybe 35 faculty. The university as a whole is very pleased with itself. It's about to hit 40,000 students this year. Jeez, so a flip. Yeah, yeah. Is this so UT, right? The undergraduate. UT. No, Lubbock? bless your heart. No, this is Texas Tech. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, no, totally sorry. fine. <laughs> it's okay. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, it's totally fine. Uh, no, so Texas Tech. So, so the the undergrads are sort of one issue, and the graduate students and the law students are sort of their own enclaves. So the law school seems to be doing fine. I am teaching entirely online. Most of my colleagues are. We are offering some classes in person at in the building if students want to go, and most students do. So the first year students have at least two and maybe three classes that are in person so they alternate like you know students with last names a through m go on mondays and wednesdays and n through z go on tuesdays and thursdays and you zoom in the other days that you're not there in person so we're doing that for some of the first year classes and i think like two of the upper level electives that everybody takes and then the more you know the smaller electives the seminars and stuff those are all virtual and then the rest of the university is doing something similar so some stuff is going to be entirely online and some stuff is this sort of hybrid model where it's partially in person and partially online we alternate days of the week so i'm like i'm managing the tech my classes are all pretty small which is nice i think the largest one is only 17 students in it oh wow um, okay i don't know how to do this for you know enormous lecture halls but i don't have to do that so i'm i'm figuring out the technology and doing it over zoom and interacting and trying to build a community and a sense of trust with students even though most of them have their cameras turned off, which is pretty hard. But, you know, yeah, we're making it work. What do you think it's going to take to get college back to normal? Like, when do you see that happening anytime in the, in the foreseeable future? I think we're waiting for a vaccine. And, and, of course, you know, concerns about will it be effective against the disease? Will it be safe? Will it have side effects? And then even... If those two things are both okay, like, can I even get it? Will there be one that's available to me and what will it cost? But I mean, the, the disease seems to crop back up again, no matter what else you've done. So it seems like a vaccine is necessary. Do you see, I mean, I, I worry a lot about my own kids, about their social developments, you know, and I mean, particularly Helen is almost three like, is it the age where she's supposed to be learning how to have friends, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, do you, do you worry about your kids' long-term mental health and all of this? I do, but I, I put that second in my hierarchy of concerns after their physical health because I feel like they can always go to therapy. <laughs> they, yeah, so I, I do worry about their mental health. I, I, but I find myself also thinking about, like, all the variety of bizarre circumstances that families and humans have been through through the course of history. I find myself thinking a lot about Laurie Ingalls Wilder and The Little House on the Prairie and how it was just that family in the middle of nowhere. It was the, all they had was each other. And I, and I often feel that way, that we're here in this house, even though my neighbor's house is like six feet, you know, east and six feet to the west. But it's it's just us in this house in a lot of ways and i and i am my kids social life in a way that i wouldn't have been otherwise right but others others humans have made it through this situation and come out relatively unscathed so i mean i've always i've always been an optimist so i i think it'll be all right <laughs> <laughs> so you 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 pulled the pin on a grenade earlier in this conversation that i i would like to go ahead and leave out <laughs> tell me, tell me your opinion of uh, the opinion of New Yorkers about the rest of the country. <laughs> um, I have been a New Yorker myself, of course. I want to say this for the benefit of your listeners. And I have been living now in Texas for 10 years. Really? And, Is that long? Yeah, it'll be 10 years in December. We're almost there. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. And I, and I realized shortly after we got here, 
that the attitudes of folks, mostly on the East Coast, also, also sort of on the left coast, uh, the West Coast rather, the attitude that everyone in the middle of the country is dumb and doesn't really understand what's going on. And I always sort of bristled at that, like, but I live here. But they always sort of assume that, but you don't really live there. I mean, I, I think a lot of our families thought we were sort of playing house here for a while, and eventually we'd move back. And then it became apparent that we weren't going to do that. But, you know, my, my mother-in-law lives in Connecticut and is always informing us what's happening, what the New York Times is reporting. And we're like, yeah, we know. She goes, oh, how do you know? And <laughs> it sort of dumbfounds us that she hasn't noticed that, like, we're, we're actually still here and operating and, like, we can, we can get the New York Times in Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> but there's this assumption that, I don't know, I guess, I guess the thing that really bristles is that the assumption that people who live in, in flyover country are dumb and don't understand what's happening, but that New Yorkers can explain it to us. Yeah. So that's it. Well, in fairness. I, yes. And I've lived, you know, I've lived elsewhere. I, I grew up, most of my childhood was in the South, mm -hmm. uh, in the deep South. Um, but I, I, I feel like, and I, and I feel like I've, I've gotten from the um, aggressive and uncouth wing of the right politically, you, you get a lot of kind of, well, you know, y'all think you're better than us kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And my, my mental response to that is usually, well, frankly, I don't really think about you that much at all. Um, <laughs> and my own reservations about the decision making about the middle of the country is not that I think on it, certainly in, individually, that I've like interacted with people and judged them to be dumb or that, you know, I think that there's something about the air in over Mississippi that makes people unintelligent. <laughs> <laughs> it's just based on the fact that Donald Trump is president now. <laughs> and it's hard for me to come up with an intelligent rationale for someone to have decided that was a good idea. It's it's results based if I have mm -hmm. judgments of the middle of the You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's no. based on I'm looking I'm looking at what happened or what happens or the decisions that come out and say I don't feel like that's a wise decision. And it's hard then not to judge the people who made those decisions. But I lived here during the Obama administration too and felt the same way. There's this sort of, I, I now perceive living here, I now perceive this sort of self-importance of the sort of New Yorker, the stereotypical New Yorker, and that what, what New Yorkers think about all day is more valuable than what I think about all day. Um, mm. Like, I, this, is, this is sort of perhaps a catty example, but you all assume when you say Greenpoint, like that I instantly know what you're referring to about that. Like that I suddenly understand the vibe, like you can name a place in Brooklyn and I, like, I can follow you. <laughs> but the reverse is not true. I make no assumption that you know anything about Lubbock, Texas. And I don't know, there's just this sort of- That's interesting. I mean, I would only assume that because I knew you lived in New York. Yes. Um, but and I I don't know, I know a couple of things about. I know Buddy Holly's from Lubbock, Texas. That's he the only is. thing I know about Lubbock, Texas. He is from so Lubbock, that's Texas. One thing, <laughs> and now I know that Texas Tech is there. That's true. That's, yeah. that's two things now at the end yeah. of this conversation. <laughs> but no, but I mean, talk more about that. Did you feel and do you feel judged negatively by your friends who are? living in bigger cities or, you know, living in New York, living in California for making the decision to be there? I mean, and do you feel that you're, that was interesting, you know, think about your opinion matters less or what you do is less important. That was a very mm. interesting thing to say. Do you feel that people feel that way about you? My good friends, no, I don't feel that from, but there is... There is a sort of casual assumption from relatives I'm not terribly close to and I don't see very often who, upon hearing where I live, immediately change the subject. And there is a sense when I go to professional conferences that I don't need to be taken seriously because of, you know, the, the U.S. news ranking of the school where I work or the place where I live and no one's ever heard of it. And is that the one where you're not the only one who's like named the wrong public Texas university 
is that the is that the city where Texas A and M is? Is that the city where the University of Texas is? And yeah, I don't know. I I I guess I I do perceive when people figure out where I live and what school I work for that they just lose interest. Whereas if I said I worked for even a lesser ranked school, but in a more interesting city, I'd, I'd be more interesting to talk to. It's interesting to hear you say that, particularly as someone who's just been there for 10 years and, you know, didn't grow up there. It's not, yeah. you know, one wouldn't speak to you and immediately know you were from, you know, you lived in Texas. Yeah. Um, Cause I, you know, looking as, as I spend far too many hours a day doing at Trumpism mm. and trying to gaze into the crystal ball and figure out what the hell is going on. I, I see a lot of defensiveness and a lot of like, I, I, I've, I've heard, I've read a couple of really good essays where people are saying that the basis of it is just, we'll show you. Mm. Like they don't, I, I think that, that a lot of a lot of really fervent Trump supporters don't really much care what his policies are. They just want to piss off liberals. They just want to mm -hmm. piss off New York and yeah. California and, you know, be like, well, we'll show you that, you know, and it's, 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 it's interesting. It's, it feels like it's not that hard to draw a line from that kind of feeling of people feel like I'm less important because I work here and live here, mm -hmm. you know, drop down six large steps to I just want the I just want to watch the world burn. <laughs> 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 I mean it, it's it's not an immediate jump, but you could see the path, you know? Yes. And I mean I'm I'm no fan of this administration, obviously, but um and it's obvious to you, I suppose, but maybe not to people listening. But I wonder if some of the appeal of Donald Trump is that he says to a lot of people in the middle of the country, no, you do matter. You are important. And if there's just some innate appeal in that, and I, I don't know if I would go as far as like, I'm just going to vote for him just to stick it to you all. But, you know, that sort of reclaiming of, of some sort of power. But I don't know, is there something about just being acknowledged that your life matters and it sucks at the moment, it shouldn't. And even though he's, he's full of empty promises, but the idea that like, I believe in your life and I want to make your life better, which is not a message that flyover country hears very often. My name is David Hoffman, and this is The Big Shut-In. I produce this show, post-production by Garrett Tiedemann. It's a production of Race Car Radio. If you're enjoying this series, I'll also steer you to our new sister series, COVID University New York. In it, the very talented Shar Adams takes a comprehensive look at life under COVID by using the City University of New York, CUNY, as a microcosm. You can find it at racecarradio.com and wherever you get podcasts. If you have feedback for me or a story that you think might be a good fit for this show, please do reach out at thebigshutin at racecarradio.com. Thank you.